Today is um, a really interesting day because we're starting a new, a new series, but it's, a, uh, it's kind of a, it's a big deal because every summer we do a book study um, through one of the books of the Bible because we want our church, our church family to grow deep in God's Word. And so we've done a lot of different uh, books in the Bible over the last 11 or 12 years. But there's one type of book in the Bible we've never done before, and we're going to do that. We're going to start that today. We've never preached through one of the Gospels. And so today we're going to start a new series preaching through one of the Gospels. The Gospels are the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the word Gospel means the good news about Jesus. So these four books are the good news about Jesus. Now, we're not going to do all four. We're going to do one of them, and it's going to be plenty. We're going to start our series today on the Gospel of John, um, and it's going to take three summers. It's going to take us three years to get through. So some of you are going to be sitting here two years from now, and you're going to say, hey, I was there the first Sunday when they, when they started that. I, I remember that. You know, it was about 100 years ago. I was there when they started that. But I want to invite you to take the journey with us, because this is going to be a rich and a meaningful and a powerful uh, journey, and I'd love for you to do it with us. So let me give you a little bit of background before we get to chapter one and kind of set up uh, the scene. So Jesus had 12 disciples. He had an inner circle of three, and John was in that inner circle. John, James, and Peter were in that inner circle uh, of Jesus. And so that man, John, is the one who wrote this book in the Bible. Now, he was a fisherman, he was a common man, uh, but he was an eyewitness to Jesus' life. Like, he he walked with Jesus for three years. So he he interacted with Jesus, he talked to Jesus, he heard Jesus' words, he saw Jesus' miracles, he heard his teaching, he got to know him on a very personal basis. This book is unique in that um, a lot of the books in the Bible are written in one setting or maybe two Uh, Most scholars believe that the Gospel of John was written over some amount of time in multiple settings. So in other words, John would write a part of it, and then he would pull away and reflect and think, and then he would go back and write some more, he would go back and write some more. And if you read through the book of John, you can see that. Like, it's very very refined, and it's very rich, and it has that... um, it has that quality of like, if you have an older, wise person in your life that doesn't use a lot of words but says a lot, you know what I'm saying? Just really uh, wise, refined language. And you're going to see that through the book as we go through it. Now, um, this book has probably had a greater impact on Christianity in the last 2,000 years than almost any other book of the Bible. It, it has had a profound impact And I want to share the purpose of the book. So uh, we're fortunate. John actually tells us in chapter 20, verse 31, he tells us why he wrote the book. And here's what he says. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. In other words, he's saying, I wrote this book so that you would believe not just that Jesus existed, but that Jesus was actually God's son. And that when you put your faith in him, that you would have life in him. And so that's the purpose of the book. The purpose of this book is to reveal Jesus, not as a prophet, not as a good person, not as a teacher, but to reveal Jesus as God's son so that people may believe and have life in him. So this book is all about strengthening our faith. And I can just say to you, if there's ever been a time that we need our faith strengthened in the person of Jesus, it's now. It's right now. And so I think this book is very timely for us. So remember, John lived with Jesus for three years. He walked with him. He talked with him. He heard and he saw. And so if you did that and you wanted to write a book to prove to people that this person you walked with wasn't just a good guy, he wasn't just wise, but he was actually God's son, where would you start? Well, here's where John started in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, (laughs) that's a great, it's always a great place to start, isn't it? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, this this, uh, English word, word, (laughs) this word, word, um, comes from the Greek because the entire New Testament's written in Greek, 
And so it's been translated into English. So the copies that we read are a translation from the original language. To get the fuller meaning, you oftentimes have to go back to the original translation. So if you look at the Greek word, the Greek word is logos. And the word logos means the creative power and authority of God. So in the beginning was the creative power and authority of God is what he's saying. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So he's, what he's saying here is, darkness cannot understand the light, but neither can it overcome it. There is a light that is shined in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it, and it doesn't know what to do with it. It can't understand it. Now, the Gospels were written in a um, unique time, a time of uncertainty, a time of unrest. For 400 years between the Old and New Testament, there was no revelation of God, there was no prophet, there was no message, there was no word. For 400 years, can you imagine that? No, no nothing. And so what happened in this time of silence is people became unsure of what to believe. Now, I think that parallels our time perfectly. We live in a time of uncertainty. We live in a time of chaos. I mean, if you think about what, what you see when you turn the television on, I mean, a lot of our college campuses are being overran with protest. We have the highest debt in world history <laughs> by amount. And by the way, it's, I think it's picking up speed. You know what I mean? You know when you get a rock going downhill, it's hard to slow it down. And that's what we got going right now. I've never uh, lived in a time where there were more conflicts in the world that threatened the stability of the whole world. We have people that are redefining beliefs that have been held for hundreds of years, and they're redefining them in months. We live in a time of huge, chaotic change that's happening faster than, than any time probably in world history. People are questioning their faith. They're questioning the reality of God. Some, some of our friends are deconstructing their faith and reorganizing what they believe. And churches, to be honest with you, are struggling how to minister and, how, and how, to, how to offer hope in these choppy waters. Every day when you open your phone, you turn your TV on, what do you get? You get endless reports uh, based on data that we rarely ever see of proving someone's position or some new crisis or some new idea and truth is relative, and so you're told that you have your own truth, and I have my own truth, and our truths aren't always the same. They don't always agree. Times are very similar to the one that John wrote in, a time of uncertainty, of confusion, and darkness, but it is against that backdrop that John says, there was a light, and that light entered into the darkness, and that darkness has not, cannot, will not overcome the light. So it doesn't matter how, yeah, that's right. It doesn't matter how modern we get, how much artificial intelligence we get. It doesn't matter how smart we get. It doesn't matter. There's one cure for darkness. It's light. And John said, Jesus is the light. There is no other light in the world. So you have this powerful line here in the beginning of John where he says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He intentionally mirrors the first line of the first book of the Bible. You, you, those of you who study your Bible, you recognize this. In Genesis chapter 1, I want to show it to you, verse 1, in the beginning. Here, here we go. John, this is where John is. In the beginning, God created the creative authority and power of God. God created the heavens and earth. The Logos was there at the beginning creating and speaking into existence. Can you imagine out of nothing, God created everything? What's a greater miracle than that? <laughs> nothing is such a, um, it's such an empty word. You and I really don't have the ability to comprehend it. It's so empty, we can't comprehend it. And out of this incomprehensible nothing, God brought everything. 
Now, now I want you just to imagine what kind of miracle that is for a minute. God had no tools. He had no wrenches and screwdrivers and hammers. He had no raw materials. He had no blueprints. He had no software. He had no artificial intelligence. He didn't have a team of specialists. There were no engineers. There were no architects. There were no artists. He didn't need any of that. He only needed one thing, and he only needed himself. And from inside himself, out of the nothingness, God brought everything. It's the greatest miracle in the history of the universe. It's incredible. Except what John is saying is, but there's one more miracle that rises to that level. And it's when God, with the creative power and authority of the universe who called everything out of nothing took on a human suit of flesh and he came to earth in the beginning was the word <laughs> and the word was God and the word was with God and the word came and dwelt among us and shined a light in the world that's what John is saying he's saying listen the James Webb telescope is never going to find anything God didn't make he made it all but there's one other miracle he did that rises to that level, and that's when Jesus came to earth and lived as a human. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. And God said, let there be light. You know what happened next? There was light. You know why? Because God said. His word, the creative authority and power of God brought everything out of nothingness, brought light into darkness. And John says what Genesis says, out of chaos and out of darkness, uh, God created light, and that light, watch this, made life possible. If you read on in the rest of Genesis chapter 1, you're not going to find, you're going to find that God made plants and he made animals and all this, because the light made life possible. So this is what John is drawing from, and he said, let me tell you something else. The Logos, the Word that was with God at the beginning, he came and took on a human form, and he his life and death and resurrection made eternal life and made spiritual life possible because the light has overcome the darkness. This is what John is saying to us. Jesus is the light of the world. All through history and all through the scripture, you see this um, contrast. Light and darkness, good and evil, truth and lies. But the light represents, in scripture and in other literature, the truth. Because the light exposes and it reveals what's hidden in the dark. If you want to know what's in a room when you walk in the room, what do you do? Turn on the light. On the light. And every time you turn on the light, something happens. You see things you didn't see before. Because you can't see in the dark. But you turn the light on, and now all of a sudden that you can see. In darkness, there's chaos and pain. If you don't believe me, if you've ever had a small child... And you've had the misfortune of walking across the living room in the middle of the night to go get a glass of water or something, barefooted, and your little barefoot, soft bottom of your foot found a child's toy, like, I don't know, a Lego or something. And you mashed your foot down on it, you know there's pain and chaos in the darkness. And you're likely to, I don't know, say things that you wouldn't say in the light of day. You know why? Because in the dark, there's chaos and pain. That's what's in the darkness. Darkness does not understand the light, and it can't overcome the light, but the light brings hope and healing and help. Now, now let's go, go on in John chapter 1 to verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, different John, not the John that wrote the book. This is John the Baptist, okay? He came as a witness to testify concerning the light. God sent John the Baptist uh, through Israel to tell people that the Messiah was coming. Because remember, there's 400 years of silence. And so, and so there had to be some alert. There had to be some awakening of, hey, something, something on the level of creation <laughs> is about to happen again. And so God sent, that's who we're talking about, to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, look, 
Although the world was made through him, in the beginning was the word, in the beginning was the creative power of God, although Jesus was part of the creative process and he is a creator of the world, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. The world, it's amazing that the creator could come and live among his creation and not even be recognized. Jesus is the light of the world. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. If this is a miracle that equals, that rivals the other greatest miracle that's ever happened in history, and that is it rivals creation, wouldn't you think we'd know it? <laughs> I mean, you can look up at the stars. We had a solar eclipse. We had uh, the, the, the um, northern lights that aren't so northern after all. Sometimes they're southern. We had those not long ago. How many of you, how many of you went out and you got, you got pictures, don't you, right? You couldn't see it but through a camera. Boy, isn't it cool? And then some of you manipulated your pictures. We saw that. It wasn't that color. It wasn't that bright. You look up and you can see, how did all this happen? Why is it that this second miracle, if it equals the first one, why do you think it is that we don't see it? Why do you think it is that we don't understand? Why would God have to send John the Baptist to announce it? Wouldn't they just see I mean, I mean, if you, if you have the, a light on in the dark, you, like you don't walk in a room and turn the light on and go, <clears throat> excuse me, I turned the light on. I want everyone to see that I turned the, nobody has to announce that you turned the light on, you turn the light on, right? We don't send like a, a town crier through the streets every morning going, attention, the sun came up, notice outside, it's no longer dark, it's now light. Nobody does that. Why? Nobody has to announce that the sun's up. Why is it if this miracle of Jesus coming was equal to creation, why is it that we had to announce it? Why is it that people can't see it? Who do we have to tell that the light's on? Listen, the blind. Blind people can't see People whose vision is growing dim because they've been overwhelmed by the chaos around them. When you are living in a world saturated in darkness and you're born in darkness and you walk in darkness and you've been born blind and you've lived blind all your life, you don't recognize your creator because you can't see the light. You have to be told. Somebody's got to tell you the lights came on. And that's what happened. That's why God sent John the Baptist into that community to say, hey, the light's coming. I'm not the light, but the light's coming. Because we don't recognize, we don't see, because we cannot see, because of our own sin and our own pride and our own selfishness and our own brokenness, and we've been living in darkness and the chaos and confusion. The light of the world has come, and Jesus is the light. But what John says is, he says, I'm not the light. He wasn't the light. I'm not the light. You're not the light. Jesus is the light. But when you and I follow Jesus, you know what we do? We reflect the light. And we share Jesus by the way we live. And as a church, that's our responsibility. You know the whole reason Jesus made the church was to shine the light to the world. The church is the only organization in the world that does not exist for itself. We don't exist to preserve ourselves. We don't exist to protect ourselves. We don't exist to become a compound. We exist to shine the light to the world. That's why we exist. So, church isn't come check the box. Church isn't how many Sundays a month do you come? Church isn't did you like that song? Church isn't well, we used to worship over here and now we worship over here because we weren't getting fed over there and now we're getting fed over there. That's not what church is. Church is that your life will become so filled with the light of Jesus Christ that you'll become so transformed that your life will shine a light in the darkness around you. That's what the church is. <laughs> you want your life to be so filled with light that it's obvious. You know, you, know why, you know when you make a difference? 
when you're different. I don't mean weird. We got enough weird. We don't need any more weird. I mean filled with the light and the love and the grace and the truth and the humility and the power and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Then you make and I make a difference. God created the church to shine the light to the world. We say it like this at Kingwood. It's one of our core values. Changed people change the world. So what our heart is as a church is that you, as you take this journey with us, that your life would become so transformed that you would actually start to make a difference in the world around you. You wouldn't just be waiting for Friday to get to the weekend, to get another paycheck, to get through the weekend, to go have a little fun so you could relieve the stress that you built up all week from, the, from work so you could just go do it again. But you not, not live for a temporary purpose, but you would actually live for an eternal purpose. That this is, all this is temporary. It's passing away. But there is a world that's coming that will never pass away. And it'll never need the sun because the S-O-N sun will be its light. Because Jesus is the light of the world. (laughs) And by the way, he's the light of the next world too. When the lights get turned on in your life, it changes everything. Let me show you in verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now that is, we, we, could, we, could do a, we could do a sermon, we could do a series right here on this one little phrase, children of God, because so many times when we think about what it means to be a Christian, we think about uh, you know, the positive impact that it's going to have on our life. We think about, you know, if I start going to church more often, maybe it'll just make my life a little bit better. And what we oftentimes think about in our interaction with faith and our interaction with God is, you know, maybe it'll make me a better version of myself. Or, or maybe, maybe in some ways it'll help me to grow so that I can become my full self. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is a heresy. The gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't say you're going to become a better version of yourself. The gospel of Jesus Christ says when you come to faith and become a child of God, you have been set in a different relationship that gives you an entirely new identity. You're a new creation. You're a new creature. You're a new person. You've been, you've been made brand new. You got, you're not only you a new person, you've got a new family. <laughs> you've been set in this whole network now. And so that's what the gospel of Jesus Christ says. That's what John is saying. You've been given the right to become a child of God, a son or daughter of God, and all the benefits and blessings of the Father are yours. All the resources of heaven are now yours. So when you you know the Father and you know that you are a son or daughter of God, then you don't have to walk in darkness anymore. You don't have to walk in chaos anymore. You don't have to walk in fear of the darkness and chaos in life because you're a child of God. You're not a better version of yourself. You're a new self. The last two verses, John chapter 1, 14 and 18. The word became flesh. The creative power and authority of God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. There's so many things in John where even in three summers, there's so many things we can't cover. I wish we could cover grace and truth. Verse 18, (laughs) no one has ever seen God. So here's the thing. Why why do we have to shine the light? No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. So you want to know who God is? You want to know who the Father is? You want to know what he's like? You want to know what he cares about? You want to know how he treats people? Here's how you know. Look at Jesus. Jesus. Because Jesus said everything the Father told him to say. Jesus did everything the Father told him to do. 
And Jesus is, Hebrews says, the exact representation of the Father. So here's what's incredible about this. The clearer picture that you get of Jesus, the clearer picture you're going to get of God. So I'm so excited about this series because you know what we're going to gain as we journey through John together? We're going to get a clearer picture of Jesus. Man, clearer picture of Jesus, which was going to give us a clearer picture of God the Father. And we're going to walk deeper in the light. And we're going to fall in love with Jesus all over again. Or maybe for some of you the first time. And it's going to be a rich and beautiful journey. This, the Gospel of John, is not about religion. It's so much deeper than religion. Religion is about checking the boxes. We sang it in the song, Have You Ever Been Washed Inside? Religion is about trying to earn. I, I, I did a class in college called Comparative Religions, and one of the things I learned, there's a lot, Christianity is very similar to a lot of religions in the world, but there's one difference in Christianity in every religion on earth. Every religion on earth has some kind of system where you earn forgiveness, where you earn your way out. You do these things and you earn your way out. Break karma, break the cycle, whatever. Christianity is the only one that has a Messiah who says, let me earn your forgiveness for you and then I'll give it to you. Christianity is the only one whose king died for us. And so this is not, this is not about religion. It's not about trying to do enough good things to earn some far off God's favor who's critical and who's hard to please. This is about relationship. So as we close, let me give you a comparison, okay? Here's what religion says. I messed up. Dad's gonna kill me. You ever been there? Maybe you've been on the other end where you're the dad, you go, I'm going to kill him. (laughs) I messed up, my dad's going to kill me. And what do we do? What do we do? Watch, what do we do? We avoid God. This is what Adam and Eve did in the garden. It's in human nature. It's in our DNA. The only way to ever have it broken off your life is the grace of Jesus Christ. There's no other way. But it is human nature, so what do we do? We avoid, can I tell you how many people there are avoiding God? Because something happened, something went wrong, something there embarrassed. I've had people tell me, oh, yeah, you invite, I'd come to church, but if I came, the roof would fall in. You know, the roof would cave in. And you know what they do? They keep their distance from church because they're trying to keep their distance from God because they think if they come close to God, God's going to punish them. And God's going to embarrass them, and he's going to shame them, and he's going to get revenge for them on them, and he's never going to let them forget what they did. Never gonna forget. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to pay for what you did. Here's what. Here's what the gospel says. I messed up. I need to call my dad. I messed up. He knows I did it. He knows what I did. But I messed up. But you know what he knows? He knows it's not who I am. It's what I did. And he loves me. And he can help me. And he can restore me. And he can walk with me. And he can help me fix this. That's the gospel. That's not religion. That's the, come on, that's the gospel. That's the gospel of Jesus. He is full of grace and truth, and he loves me unconditionally. So the question is, how do you view God? Do you view God as a person that's filled with consequences? Or do you, or do you view God as a God that's compassionate? Do you think about God as a God who can't wait to punish you? Or do you think about God as a God who longs to restore you? Here's what I think. The the longer I've walked this journey, the more convinced I become. There's actually nobody in the world that doesn't want Jesus. I think everybody actually wants Jesus. I just think they can't see him. They can't really see him. They think it's about their uncle went to church and their grandpa was a pastor. They think it's about, they think they know what it's about. What it's about (laughs) is blindness that prevents you from seeing who Jesus really is. And if you can see him, I mean really see him. Man, 
there's a light that shined in the darkness. Maybe, maybe you're watching online. Maybe even some point in the future, maybe you're here in the room and you're thinking, listen, I've heard things like this before. And maybe you don't even know how to, maybe you don't even know how to verbalize it, but you have this reluctant sense that if I let my guard down, I'm going to get hurt. And I, I understand that. I do. Because if life has hurt you in some way or people that you trust have hurt you in some way, it's really hard to take a step of faith because in the end, a step of faith is a step of trust. It's where you're kind of saying, hey, I'm going to leave myself vulnerable and you know, I, I hope this works out. I, I do understand that. I understand those feelings. I understand the experiences that probably bring many of us to those feelings. But, but, I, but I want you just to hear something today. But the only other option to letting your guard down and to taking a step of faith toward Jesus is to walk in the darkness. That, that is the only other option. And in the darkness, there is confusion and there is pain and there is chaos. It's not that when you take a step into the light, everything instantly turns perfect. <laughs> because we still have a lot of darkness in our world and we all have some darkness in us that we have to let Jesus shine the light and keep getting the darkness out of us. But it's only a hundred billion times better than walking in the darkness. So if you, if you maybe have spent any time wondering if God is real or you've struggled to believe or your faith has wavered or the chaos and complexity of our times has dampened your faith, if your faith has become passive or maybe apathetic, if your love for Jesus has lost its fire, if life has beat you up and your faith has become weak, can I just say it this way? Life will beat the faith out of you. <laughs> it absolutely will. If any of that's you, this series, this gospel is for you. John wrote this book so that you might believe so that the light might flow into your mind and into your heart and into every part of your life and transform you. Would you stand with me? The light has entered the world and the darkness has not overcome it. As our worship team is coming to lead us, would you just close your eyes for a minute and lift your heart and your mind to Jesus? Lord, I just confess today in my own life, you are the light. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the light. You said no man comes to the Father, no person. No man or woman comes to the Father except through you. And so, Lord, as we lift our hearts up to you this morning, I pray that you would shine the light into our lives, that we might know your love, we might know your truth, we might know your grace so that we might be free. As our worship team leads us, sing this song with us.